and a very uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to this live Landor webinar. I hope you're all managing to keep cool. Um, I, for one, am extremely grateful it's cooled down a little bit more than yesterday. Um, so the webinar um, that we're going to be doing today um, is on healthcare parking, and we're going to be talking about innovative solutions for hospital and medical parking. Uh, before we start, I'd really like to thank um, Landor uh, live for putting on this webinar and also uh, my company Unity 5 Zap Park for sponsoring the event. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Sharon Silcock and I'm the Head of Business Development for Unity 5. Um, known in the industry as Zap Park, Zap Park's actually the name of our, our software that we supply into both the public and private sector. So I I've been in the industry for about 11 years now. Um, I've worked both in the private and the public sector. I've worked in that 11 years uh, for three different um, software companies, um, you know, supplying into this sector. Um, I've had quite a lot of experience. We've got a really um, fantastic panel lined up for you today. So if you just want to go on to the next slide, um, there's been a slight change of plan and originally we were having um, Peter Aldridge, who um, is the Associate Director at Leeds Teaching Hospital, um, but unfortunately he's had to be called away for an emergency, an operational emergency at the last minute. And I'm delighted to say that Barry Waterhouse, who's the Group and Travel Access Manager um, at the Northern Care Alliance NHS Trust, he stepped in with literally two hours notice uh, and managed to put some slides together. So massive um, thank you to Barry, because I think we, we really need his input really um, on this. We've also got Scott Gow, who's the Sales and Commercial Director of WPS. We've got David Fowle, who's the Managing Director of HOSAR, and Rachel Baxter, who's the Operational Director of Total Parking Solutions. Now, it's a really good panel. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, I just wanted to say, is if um, we want this to be as interactive a session as possible, so we do need your in input to make it um, work. So if you've got any comments or anything, just stick them in the um, chat, just Put your contact details in there if you want just to say hello let me know that you're here and um, if you've got any questions for myself or any of the other panelists um, please put them in the q a so it's going to follow the same format if you've ever been on any of these webinars before um, each of the panelists is going to share a few slides and then we're going to open up a discussion for everybody to 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 ask a lot of questions. So I'm going to kick it off by just trying to get the um, conversation going um, and I'm just going to share a few slides and then we'll be going on to Barry and then on to Scott, David and then Rachel. So it's kind of how it's um, laid out there. So if you just want to go on to the first slide and um, that's great. So I am um, going to cover up what the three things that I really want to, to cover off really is what type of enforcement works best in this sector. Should NHS staff pay to park at work. I know that is a real controversial um, subject, but I, I thought we couldn't have a, a discussion really on healthcare parking with, without bringing that up. Um, how can technology help this sector improve operations? So I'm just going to be covering those three points. So moving on to the enforcement in healthcare. So I personally think it's a necessary evil um, you know, I think you do need to have some kind of enforcement in this setting to, to maintain the facilities um, the trust that I've worked with um, over the years um, all tend to do enforcement merely as a deterrent rather than, you know, making a revenue stream. Um, Peter, who was um, obviously going to be on the call originally, they do enforcement at Leeds Teaching um, Trust, but they do it every single bit of revenue that they make from the enforcement and the parking revenue, it all goes back into the, the maintain, maintaining of the trust um, and, you know, any extra money goes into the NHS. So I, I personally think it is, it, it is worth, worth doing. Um, one of the questions that I get asked a lot by um, people that are looking to set up in um, enforcement in this sector, whether it be uh, an NHS trust who's going to, to manage their own facilities or one of our parking operators that we supply into. Um, one of the common questions is what is the best type of enforcement? Um, and what I would uh, recommend is obviously each site is different and it depends what the trust want to achieve 
by doing enforcement. But what I do and, and what my team does here at Zap Park, um, and I'd recommend to any other software supplier to do, is go out to site, walk around the site, you know, see where the staff are parking, see where the um, visitors park, before you give any recommendations, really, because every site is different. So in terms of like software, which is, is what we do, we supply trust with software to manage the parking. Uh, we supply parking operators to manage um, the parking on behalf of trust. Um, and we supply, it can be done in a, in a different, many, many different things, right? It can be done uh, through CTV enforcement, uh, through an AMPR vehicle driving round, or it can be done through a mobile device. Um, so the officer walking around and, and issuing tickets. So it, it just depends on the site, really. I mean, usually, I'd say most use a combination um, of all different, th different three and each one um, has its benefits. Um, a lot of hospitals tend to use AMPR enforcement on things like their ambulance lanes, because obviously they have to keep that clear, it might be a matter of life and death. So um, one of the other things that I suggest to, to trust when they're looking to do enforcement is make sure the supplier, the software supplier that you're going to use has lots of AP, you know, like a integrations already set up. And the reason for that is because, you know, you're not going to get one company that does everything. You're going to get different companies that are specialists in it. So if you make sure they've got them integrations in place um, before you set up, it can, you know, be very um, you know, cost saving really. Um, there's no doubt about it in my opinion, you know, opinion, um, you know, enforcement definitely Im improves compliance at site and it'd be really interesting having uh, Barry on the call um, just to get his take on it really and if we've got any, um, anyone else for any trust on the call, you can, you know, put your experience of, of introducing enforcement to trust. Um, if you put that in the comments, it'd be great to hear that later. So one thing um, I would suggest that I think is really important if you are going to introduce enforcement, um, make what is <laughs> an unpleasant experience because no one likes to get a PCN um, as pleasant as possible. So make sure you, you, you provide the motorist with a PCN portal. So if, if they are unlucky enough to get a ticket, they can, you know, when they come back to the vehicle, they can um, view the evidence online um, usually in real time, they can um, pay for the PCN, they can make a representation for the, the PCN or they can transfer the liability. It just gives them that um, better experience uh, of a negative one, really. So on my next slide, the next thing that I, I want to touch on, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, as I say, Barry's probably got a, a, a take on this and um, that he wants to share with you. Um, but one thing that I do want us to consider today is, is if we, if staff should pay for their parking at work. I mean, the pandemic saw, um, they saw free parking introduced to all NHS staff, and that was in July, 2020, and it actually cost the NHS 130 million in the last two years. So it is expensive um, to the government. Um, the current legislation, and I'm sure someone will tell me on the call um, if I'm wrong, um, but in England, um, the, the latest legislation is that it's up to the individual trusts whether they charge staff for parking but they've made recommendations for special categories um like mandatory rec recommendations so if you have a, a sick relative or you're a, a staff member that's working nights there's certain categories that they recommend that the trusts offer them free it'd be really good to hear from uh, any of our people in the in the sector that are working in NHS in Wales or Scotland because they do offer free parking for staff. Um, I know there's been case studies over the years. Um, I think they've been free in Wales since 2018. And the case studies have shown that, you know, the facilities have struggled, um, you know, to, to, to have the security uh, because they haven't had the funding basically. So it'd be interesting to hear if we've got anyone on the call, um, just what your take on that or any other, um, what you think a fair solution is really. So the next thing that I want to cover um, as part of my presentation would be um, how us as technology providers can help the industry really issue with, you know, with common issues that come up in the NHS sector. 
So at Zap Park, one of the things we've done, the innovative solutions, if you like, we've come up with is just continually developing our, our software. So for example, our mobile app um, that, you know, officers had used to go around and issue um, parking charge notices, um, they would, uh, it's more than just an app. So it's basically an asset management tool. So officers can use it as a two-way com communication thing. So if they're going around the site and they see like a broken lamp or they see um, a broken pane display machine, they can send a special message to the back office team. Uh, they can take photographs um, on the app and they can get that information to the right department as soon as possible to help them really and they can even send the messages directly to the third party provider as well um as i say it's a two-way communication so if the back office have a special message that they want to get down to the um enforcement team on the ground and not to enforce on a certain vehicle or something that's happening on site they can get that message down uh, as well so it's just always as a technology company we're looking at ways in which we can and, um, you know, improve our software. And there's no doubt about it. It definitely improves compliance, helps, um, you know, the, the trust we work with uh, generate revenue, reduce their running costs, uh, and just in general streamline their process, processes, really. Um, we have come up with amazing self-serve to um, portals, I say, on both the permits and the PCM, where the end user can go on and, and manage their own account. Um, I'll just touch upon the permit system um, next, if you just want to go on to the next slide, please, uh, Mark. So um, one of the things um, I think is really important um, for a trust, if, they, if they're looking to upgrade their um, existing permit system if they're on a paper system and they wanted to go virtual or if they're you know looking for at a new supplier one of the things that they really should consider is that they choose a permit system that is future proof what i mean by that is you know look at the long term picture if they don't want to do for example emission based permits at the moment make sure you get a system um, that can adapt as you change as an organization um also um i would say you know, look at the um, staff user journey. I, I know years ago when um, I was working with a particular trust, uh, we were trying to upgrade um, staff, get staff to go on an open account and, um, you know, apply for their own permits online. It was a bit of a mammoth task really. Um, and I think if you can simplify as a technology company, if you can simplify that process um, by offering things like single sign on for staff, um, you know, we are developing at Zap Park a permit app to make that user journey even better. I think all things like that um, really help the transition um, into a, a digital permit system. So um, one of the other things, and I think what I've just alluded to previously, the, the constant, you know, the changing in legislation and stuff, it's good to choose a permit system that's very easy for whoever's going to be managing the back office to, to, to make changes, configuration changes, business rule changes. So if they need to suddenly introduce a permit type that's free or, or you know, pick a permit system that's going to adapt and that you're going to be able to manage yourself rather than have to go through your software provider to make that um change um for yourself and again what i said before make sure you you, you pick a system that integrates with, with with all the other um platforms really so the one thing um the next slide that i want to talk about is the self-serve websites um as i say i think these are absolutely vital in improving customer services, but also there's been studies done to say that they do help the organizations that use them, whether it be in the healthcare sector, um, local authorities, they do help, um, you know, generate revenue, um, and they also help the back, back office team reduce that avoidable contact as well. So on the self-serve portal that we have, I say, a motorist can, you know, view the PCN um, that they've been given, they can pay for it or they can make a representation. It just stops that frustration that you get when you get a, a ticket that you can communicate with someone directly, um, I think. And, and obviously then, then they're provided 24 seven as well. So on the to the next slide, uh, Mark, please. And um, one of the other things, um, and obviously I'm not gonna do a big sales pitch here, but one of the other things that we, we've developed at Zap Park, which is a really useful um, bit of software for the healthcare sector in particular, is our Zap Kiosk. 
Now, this is like an app that can go onto any Apple or Android device and it can be um, standalone or it can have an attendant. And basically, um, one of the one of the trusts that we're working with uses this for their end of life patients. So when relatives are coming to the hospital and it, it's a very, very stressful situation, rather than to have to sort out the parking, they can just key in their registration into this. Uh, they automatically go into a whitelist and it stops them, you know, getting that tickets and it obviously helps helps the organization um, you know, prevent that. You know, nobody wants to get that negative PR, do, do they, about someone that's received a PCN um, visiting a sick relative so yeah it's all different things like that and i'm sure um the, you know the other panelists um will be able to give you um some more innovative ideas as well so um if you just want to go on to the next slide that's kind of me done enough talking if anyone's got any questions at all i can see some questions are coming in now into the q a um you know just keep just keep firing them in there and we'll go through them at the end. If you want to contact me about anything that I've talked about today, uh, there are my contact details. So we are going to move over to um, Barry. Um, I say it's Barry Waterhouse. He's a group and travel access manager at the Northern Care NHS Trust. He's been, I think everybody knows, as we say, uh, Barry has been in the industry for um, about 20 years, Barry, you, you can tell me. Um, I 15 met Barry, years, I'm 15, 15 years, years younger than I look, Sharon. <laughs> um, I've uh, known Barry for about six years now. And as I say, he's got a wealth of knowledge on this sector. So I'm um, really interested um, to hear your thoughts really, Barry. So I will um, leave you to it. And obviously um, we'll catch up later. So over to you. Uh, morning everybody, uh, thank you for, for putting up with me at the last minute. Uh, I've just got a few quick slides to go through, um, just to go from a, an NHS perspective. Uh, I've noticed there's some questions in the chat about relevance and Scotland and everything else. I, I'll just quickly go through that, yeah, some of the things you might not be relevant, but if you just think it's part of a wider thing. But a little bit about us and the Northern Care Organisation and the Northern Care Alliance, uh, just some points there. The two key points on that slide are the top and the bottom. We've got 19 and a half thousand staff, but we only have around 6,000 plus parking spaces. So even if we were able to obtain all the capital funding we could ever need, uh, there's no way we could build enough parking spaces for everybody to fit in. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and that's the other thing is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit differently. We've started off talking about parking management and parking systems. But for us as an NHS organisation, it's not just about car parking. Par car parking is part of our more holistic package. Um, we currently have a task and finish group that's reviewing within our organisation, charging for staff, our criteria and all aspects of parking and travel. The biggest challenge we have for each of those meetings is trying to say it is not just about parking. Uh, I'll just put the slide in there. Obviously, a slight misinterpretation of the wording, but we do tend to have a monthly parking lot workshop meeting uh, at our trust, and it's just trying to steer people away from that. Ne next slide, please. So what we're trying to do is we're reinventing an old concept. So from my travel background and my 15 years and having learned quite a lot of lessons the hard way, we're trying to apply this new concept in that it's travel demand management. Uh, and we need to deliver each of those one, two, three aspects. Historically, uh, we've used parking management, parking permits and charges to deliver aspect one. We've looked to produce additional car parks as part of aspect two, and we haven't done much on aspect three. Next slide, please. That's just a quick, but this should be, this is what we're aiming for it to be and, and the approach that we're trying to take that's also linked to our delivery of a net zero national health service and our wider sustainability and travel packages as part of our patient and visitor experience, delivery of goods, and also our staff and colleague parking. Next slide, please. So again, just quickly running through where I mentioned aspect one is the parking management. Some of the bits that Sharon's been referring to, parking enforcement, alternative pay. These are all part of that aspect one. But for us as an NHS organisation and for most of my colleagues who are on NHS, you need something that delivers 
but, but it delivers all of these aspects together. Next slide, please. So where we've got capacity creation, historically, you'll just see the, the, the picture in the top right hand corner is our Westwood Park staff car park. Some transport consultants use that as a perfect example of induced demand. Uh, we need a better system at the moment of managing that. And it's trying to look at the technology to allow us to do that. If you look at the bottom section there, just between the grass bit, originally that was built as additional capacity. So the idea was that would be totally empty day in, day out. Within 18 months, we had that situation there and it's far worse now. So it's trying to look at all of these aspects together. And again, back to that TDM concept. Next slide, please. The bit that we're also trying to link into our parking management, our enforcement, charging for permits and everything else is behavior change. The key bit is behavior change. If we can change our staff and commuting travel behavior, and then ultimately that then cascades to our patient and visitor travel behavior and the wider community, that is the bit that's making a difference for us. Next slide, please. Just a little quick bit on our travel hierarchy. Most of people will have seen that. It's trying to avoid travel wherever we can um, and try and commute differently. For the pandemic, the change that was most positive for us was working from home, that suddenly it, it suddenly changed. We got large percentages of staff working from home and our challenge with the parking systems and the parking management is to keep that flexibility and encourage hybrid working and actually make sure that people aren't penalised or, or disincentivized for, for, for not coming to work by car. Next slide, please. The way that we're doing that, and I've purposely removed our parking because we do work. And before the call, I was on large number and everybody, everybody knew me, which was a little bit frightening. I've removed the parking companies, but this is just the example from our alternative travel behavior. We try and have a collaboration. It's an honest, open partnership of expertise and idea sharing, making it happen. Um, we work with all these organizations, but the bit that I'm key to doing is being open and honest with each other what we can do together, what we can share together. And this resonates with some of the points that Sharon was making, the ideas about API and technology. Uh, next slide, please. So again, they're encouraging behavior change. That's just the basic quotes for what we're trying to do. So again, what we're trying to do with all our patient and visitor travel and everything else is try and keep that aspect in place with all the technology and the systems that we've got. Uh, next slide, please. So again, it's just the bits. These are also the bits that it's difficult. I'm blessed in that I, this is my role. Monday to Friday, I get parking and travel and air quality within part of a sustainability team. I know a number of NHS colleagues and colleagues and organizations. It's just that little bit of extra bit that you really don't want to deal with. But our parking management systems, our parking enforcement needs the flexibility to encourage the small positive changes. Next slide, please to enable those small positive changes. So can we change the way that we manage our parking to encourage people that they're not gonna be penalized for not parking on a particular day? Next slide, please. Making it better. I've used the example of our cycle hub. The one on our left was our worst possible one, but we're looking at making those improvements with every system and process that we have is we, we wouldn't wanna be using the facility on the left. We might be convinced to use that facility on the, on the right. Next slide, please. And again, using technology to analyze our air quality and wider transport impacts. That's what we're looking for from the systems and the processes and the management that we have in place. It's got to do more now, but, but we're quite positive that we're able to do it. Next slide, please. Again, just key points from up there. Keep it simple and flexible. Think differently. Everybody has an opinion on parking. Uh, I can't talk about the uh, uh, operations and surgery. Uh, a consultant would call me out if I started to give him the benefit of my experience on surgery. However, when it comes to parking and travel, everybody has an, uh, everybody has an opinion and you have to try and talk that and take that into account. The other issue, which we find working as part of a group and part of a national performance advisory group for the NHS on travel and parking is the HTM 0703 provides guidance, but not stick rulings. And again, it's just that information there. NHS locations are all the same when it comes to parking and travel in some of our aspects, but we're also uniquely different. 
So there is never going to be one complete solution. There might be something global that you can improve, but you've always got to look uniquely different. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. I hope I've managed to keep him with my five minutes uh, and I'll happy to answer any questions later on. Oh, Harry, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Um, and as I say, can't thank you enough for stepping in at the, at the last minute. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, I just want to apologise, sorry, because I was going through my slides and anyone who knows me knows <laughs> I'm not very good at multitasking and, and someone was asking me a question when I was going through my bit about Scotland and I didn't see it until after I'd finished. Um, I was going to touch upon um, the situation in Scotland and, and, and Wales um, uh, later on when we, ha we had our discussion. So moving on, nextly, uh, the next panellist that we want to introduce is, is Scott Gow. Um, Scott is the Sales and Commercial Di Director for WPS. Um, he's been in parking for about 14 years, is that right, Scott? No, double that, 28 years for my sins. Gosh, you don't look old enough. You really don't look old enough. Oh, um, you haven't seen me in the morning. <laughs> I've known Scott, um, we, we've bumped into each other, haven't we, on and off over the years. Um, so it's like in this industry at events and stuff. And um, Scott's got a really good um, presentation that he's going to share himself with us today. So over to you, Scott. Okay, as um, Sharon um, alluded to, um, for my sins, I've been in parking for 28 years. It's not a sector you choose. It's not um, a sector you wake up one day and build, you know what, I've always wanted to work in parking. It's it's something that happens. I think most people that um, gets involved in parking, at that point, you never seem to get out. You're always classed as the expert in parking. So the next few slides is really focusing on um, my experiences of working in the healthcare sector, but also um, the experience I've built over those um, almost three decades of working within the parking sector with various different technologies. Um, just a small background to, to how big the parking industry is, which I'm sure most people know, but um, if you start looking at um, the UK and you start taking the healthcare into account, there's over 17,000 car parks. Um, that equates to around about 8 to 11 million parking spaces. Um, if you actually look at the worldwide in, in terms of the actual size of the marketplace, it equates to around about 32 billion pounds by 2025. Um, it's quite significant um, in terms of when you actually look at these car parks and these um, vehicles that are parked up, um, you're talking around 39 million vehicles in the UK and up to 90% of the time those vehicles are parked up. Um, one of the things that certainly WPS and what I've learned over the years is the smart parking elements. People talk about utilizing technology in terms of how you can actually improve the parking experience and they talk about um, smart parking spaces um, that certainly offers an advantage but the, the, the challenge is, is the cost of this experience um, but it's well known that if you have a smart city or a smart car park it does save a significant amount of time and some of those technologies can be simple such as um, base sensors and big analytics um, simple things such as a VMS board or smart permits just to actually make it easier to actually enforce. It never ceases to amaze me, no matter what operators or technology companies do, parking is always on the brunt of it being a negative experience. And if you look at some of the surveys that I've done out there, this one in particular, 90% um, of people who use car parking said that they experienced either finding a space or finding a way around the car park, um, which again, bearing in mind there's technologies out in the industry that can address and fix these problems, they still exist um, today. If you look at just um, hospitals in England alone, um, last year they generated 254 million pounds um, and over half of the trust involved in that was generating over a million pounds. Um, bear in mind, we've already talked about that Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland are free parking. And I have partners in Scotland um, who have struggled ever since they abolished parking charges. Um, as Sharon alluded to, that money that was generated from the parking fees have now gone. So maintaining the actual infrastructure, maintaining, to maintain security, um, has been very prohibitive in terms of taking that away. So how, how do you actually start addressing in, in terms of taking the pain out of parking? 
I saw one of the questions um, that spoke about um, making it simpler and not focus on the enforcement. WPS I class is the way the good part, the positive part, part. We don't get involved in enforcement in any shape and form. It's, it's about barrier control parking. So you get in through either taking a ticket or ticketless, or you're a permit holder and you get out based on that your payment or you're allowed to get out based on being a permit holder. More importantly, one of the things that I know was recently discussed um, in terms of the parking guidance was simple validations. Again, historically, this was something that was very convoluted. Um, it meant that um, a patient or visitor who is entitled to um, concession parking meant they had to go and find a control room or security room to get their ticket validated. Um, the way we've addressed this is our platform is very much um, an IP weight based application. So David Malone in um, Newcastle um, Teaching Trust, what they're doing is implementing 30 scanners around the hospital. And that's at ward level, at clinic level, um, where now people who are eligible can get discounted or free parking simply by just presenting their ticket to the member of staff to get their ticket validated, which will give them a number of hours or um, totally free parking. But it's also looking at actually working with hospital trust in terms of how we look at um, the car parks and how they use that space more um, effectively. One thing I've found um, coming out of the pandemic, hospital trusts have obviously been given free parking to staff. That is now being stopped. Um, but what is highlighted is the current asset. And I do see it as an asset, but it's not recognised as an asset. It's not working and they need to know how it can work more efficiently. Um, certainly integrating with more what I would class as complicated permit systems such as ZAPAR. We do integrate with other um, application systems, but we're finding that they now want um, location-based permitting. They want to have an ability to reject or approve permits. Some at the moment want the ability to reject in the future, but may not be implemented day one, but certainly want to have ability based on where they live or what criteria, where they can car share with other members of staff um, would also come into the fact of it. But again, just using simple technology that guides vehicles to where the spaces are. And that could be simply just at the entrance to the site that shows the car park spaces um, per car park, but actually once they get to the actual relevant car park itself, again, drill down, even to the point of going down to zonal. Um, the only bit we have to be mindful of is when we try to implement these systems, it's fine when we actually install the infrastructure ourselves, it becomes very simple, but it's actually involving your IT and involved in this process because sometimes that can be quite convoluted and quite difficult when we're integrating into hospital networks. But also just making payment simpler and painless, which I will then talk about next few slides. Um, as I said, in terms of guidance, there is technology that's already out there that is used, it's tried and tested over many, many years. And that data can be collected simply by loops, barriers, but they're more complex, they're more expensive are things such as sensors and cameras. But they obviously give you a higher granularity in terms of how the space is being utilized rather than just a particular zone or a car park. Um, this data can be sent to a control room in real time. Um, it can actually be to a mobile um, device. So because ours is the web browser application, um, it works on iOS and Android. So your operational staff can be mobile and also have that information in real time. So again, they can see as car parks are filling up and how they're being utilized. And actually, if you want to manually direct um, traffic to relevant car parks. As I said, the VMS, that can be at um, car park level as well as um, at zonal and site level. Um, but it is very much, if you want to, going down right down to bay level um, using these A and PR. So this tends to be used more on retail, where you're actually within a multi-story car park. You can see um, visually from a distance what bays are in use and what bays are not. Um, and again, this data can be pushed for other third-party apps. So um, route planning, um, again, data around um, how the car park's being used, um, utilization, peak times, again, trying to actually develop policy around transport planning. This kind of information could be used in terms of um, peak times around your sites. 
In terms of payments, um, this is what we would call our old fashioned standard um, payment option. So you've got what I would call a tin box. So you've got the standard 12 inch for a cashless terminal. You've got a 24 inch for your full cash terminal, which enables you to take cash, notes, cards, contactless. Um, but more recently, there was a 32 inch touchscreen, which is more suited to be inside the hospital or um, trust environment where it's entirely touchscreen, it's entirely ticketless, and it's entirely cashless. Um, but as I said, we have a multitude of um, options such as cash card, contactless, Apple, Google Pay. But more importantly, we're finding hospital trusts are adopting a subscription model. So this um, enables them to have an account where they can top up. It can be done online, but more recently, most trusts issue their staff or the um, user a proximity card. And they can go to the pay station and they can have a weekly, a monthly, half yearly, no, a yearly permit, which they tap on the screen and it then presents how much they have to pay for that particular fixed period. That then locks them into that month um, and they can use that car park um, around what they're governed to do. So if they're Monday to Friday, nine to five, that's what that card will allow them to get into that car park. Again, you can restrict it to zones and areas to also buy by that single card. But that account is also linked to registration number as well. So if you have ANPR, we don't use ANPR for enforcement. It's purely for identification reasons. Um, that also has a backup in terms of that proximity card linked to a registration number that would also allow them in and out of that car park based upon the criteria behind it. Um, but we're also seeing that they want to utilize these pay stations for other benefits. So it's not just for taking payments. So the 32 inch and the 24 inch, you can start having tutorials, how to use the system, how to pay, or just information around the hospital itself. This is probably the, the biggest change in terms of how people are looking at wanting to bring into payments within the healthcare. It's been already embraced within local authorities. So we currently integrate um, two, major, two major providers such as Ringo and Just Park in two large local authorities who convert to pay and display park parks to pay on foot. We wanted predominantly to enhance the customer experience. Um, they were tired of whatever happened. Parking was always on the brunt of a negative um, user experience, predominantly by, based by media perception, media manipulation. So by introducing pay on foot meant that they only pay for what they use. Um, but also recognizing one of these was Cornwall Council. They had 10 car parks. One of the challenges were that people come off the beach, they go to the car, they load the family up, load the car, and then they realise they haven't paid. Um, to look across the car park and see a lengthy queue for people trying to pay at pay station. So they asked us if we could link to Just Park, who is their incumbent cash provider. So we did. It took us about a day and a half to integrate with them. But what that has now the benefit is what they call pay station in your pocket. Um, Cornwall is a ticketed site. So within the app, it enables the user to scan the barcode, make the payment through the app, drive to the exit, and the barrier raises and lets them out. So it's just now enhanced that customer experience rather than being stood in the queue, reminding what a rubbish day it was, even though it was only the last 30 seconds to a few minutes. Now it's just finished that experience off to be much more pleasant. Um, but more recently, just done that with Ringo as well. Um, we also have an, an option as well where we've got WPS Pay, but also the other cash providers um, provide an ability to scan QR codes. So no longer do you have to download a physical app. So it means you can have signage around the car parks or within the, uh, the trust itself, the hospital itself, enables the user to use their smartphone, scan a QR code, and it takes them to a payment page and make that payment through, such as Apple Pay or Google Pay on the wallet within their smartphone. It is just another payment option. We recognize it's not something that will be used by everybody based on demographics, but it's just another aspect that enhances that customer experience and makes it slightly more um, customer friendly. As I said, we are now finding ourselves having to link to more complicated systems. We are a manufacturer and we, yes, we are a software house, but we don't claim to be experts in all the other fields. So it'd be a bit remiss for us to actually dictate or control um, what systems you use. 
So through our APIs, we're enabled to actually link to many third party systems. As I mentioned, we've done this with Zappart, we've done this with other permit systems within the marketplace, and it works very well in terms of you given the best solution for your users of the system. Um, as I alluded to, one of the things that we're finding more and more people want to use is to be able to offer discounts and concessions, whereas historically, historically this has been very complicated, but this has been simplified by just simplifying, adding um, CAT scanners around the hospital. Um, even simpler than that, we did this with Clatterbridge with Liverpool City Council. They had no hardware at all, just a trust PC, and we loaded a web page on that PC. The trust opened up two ports to our server, which was located in Liverpool City Council, and they was able to use a standard trust PC, enter in VRN, and actually given two hours discounted parking to the um, outpatients of um, using Clatterbridge. So again, it was just making that user experience much more simple. And that's my bit around the parking. And thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Scott. That was really good. Um, really interesting to get your perspective on it. Um, we now have David Fowle, who's the managing director of Hozar. He's been with Hozar for about six years. Um, I met David about um, 18 months ago when I was working with a trust trying to find a solution um, where they were looking for like a late pay solution on the camera. Um, so hopefully um, Dave will be able to give you a bit more information about that. So over to you, Dave. Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I want to focus primarily on the stress of parking. So I should say, firstly, I'm from an NHS family uh, for four generations. So whether it's GPs, anaesthetists, neurologists, facilities, hospital managers, uh, we've got one of a, just about everything in my family. Uh, which unfortunately means Christmas dinner in my household is about four hours straight of uh, NHS political debate. Having been the black sheep in the family and, and not joined the NHS, but instead gone into parking, I've got something of an insight as to some of the problems uh, around parking and, and some of the stresses that parking causes. So if you see on the next slide here, there have been uh, a number of studies on, on stress in parking. As you can see for the graph on the right, huge number of people uh, find uh, the event of having to park, whether it's having to pay for parking, whether it's worrying about not knowing how long you'll be, a uh, very stressful experience. And I'll give one anecdotal uh, story on this. At my dad's hospital, whenever they do a blood pressure test, they ask the patient coming in whether they've parked their car or whether they've come in via uh, public transport. If the patient has parked, they ask them to sit for a further 10 minutes before taking their blood pressure because they know that parking is so stressful, it will have a measurable effect on blood pressure in a clinical setting. Now, that seems insane to me that in our places of health, we are tolerating parking systems that are so bad that they are having a, uh, such a significant and easily measurable clinical effect. Um, so some of the problems on the left, I'm sure uh, you guys from a facilities point of view are, are well aware of. The uh, number of appointments that are missed for parking uh, nationally are increasing. There are issues around lack of clear signage and information. Of, of particular relevance uh, in hospitals uh, is not knowing how long, from a patient perspective, how long the patient will be. Long delays, unavoidable in the current climate, uh, leads patients to pay for two hours, be waiting for three hours in the hospital, and then get a penalty or a parking charge notice uh, simply for having to wait uh, to see their doctor. And the problems, of course, aren't related just patients, uh, many staff have a lot of stressful experiences around parking. So in a hostel car park that we're in, for example, uh, we've had nurses come to us that say under the previous regime, before we implemented our changes, uh, they were, they had to choose. Uh, one, one nurse in particular springs to mind, there's a very strict parking regime. And they were telling me they had to choose between 
spending the last few moments with a patient of, of their lives or getting back to their car so they didn't get a parking charge notice. Uh, it's in the uh, northeast of England. Frankly, that is an unacceptable situation uh, for a nurse on uh, 22K, I think she was on. Uh, she, she, she was telling us to have to make that decision between a 60 pound parking charge notice and staying with a patient in the, in, in the final moments of their life. I think that's frankly wrong. Uh, and there's a lot more we can do to solve that situation. So as you'll see on the next slide, uh, one more slide, please. Thank you. So this is one example of a hospital um, car park that we've been introduced into um, in, in Hull in England. So our system fundamentally relies on flexibility. Uh, and, and actually, funnily enough, it was designed with the NHS in mind. I mean, with the familial background, uh, I can't help but think of, of hospitals when I think of parking. We developed a fully automatic system that relies on automatic number plate recognition. So all staff and visitors are charged by this mechanism. So there's no need for an app, absolutely no need for payment terminals, no need for barriers, and frankly, no need for parking charge notices either. Everyone is signed up and they are simply then charged for the length of stay. This allows, so first you've got that convenience of you don't have to manually do anything to pay. We're just simply linked directly to the bank account so we can charge automatically and accordingly. But there's a number of really interesting benefits that come off of that that fundamentally change how the car park works. So the first thing, the most important thing perhaps is no one has to guess how long they're going to be in the car park anymore. So it's like pay on exit, but fully automatic because you don't have to manually make the payment. But there's even more benefits around flexibility because our system can automatically tag different accounts so that different users are treated in different ways. For example, in this particular car park, NHS staff who are obviously regular parkers compared to a lot of patients pay a subsidized rate compared to say, for example, the uh, patients who are irregular. Not only that, but we can set up systems so that uh, what we call price capping, which if anyone's familiar with, uh, for example, the London Oyster card, works in a similar way in that if staff have to come and go, they can be treated as having one long session as opposed to a series of more expensive multiple sessions. Particularly useful for staff that work partly off-site, for example, providing care in the community and might be going back and forth to the hospital four, five, six times a day they are able to pay a singular, much cheaper rate, and our system works that out automatically. We're also able to cater for different patient groups, which are particularly important, particularly around things like uh, those needing long-term repeat visits to hospital. So these guys can be given either free parking automatically or a much reduced rate. We're also able to, I noticed one of the questions was around pay-as-you-go permits, we're able to do, um, provide a very innovative system that allows for things like a uh, 50 pounds a month permit, say, uh, but that has a maximum of three times a week usage or a more expensive permit that has any time usage. So essentially the whole system is designed to give maximal flexibility to staff. We don't want staff having to pay the highest permit rate if they're only going to be parking two days a week, just as an example. Uh, we are also able to work with many of the tra uh, travel planning uh, concessionary bodies. So, for example, uh, some trusts are looking at reduced parking for um, EV cars, which, again, our system, as you would imagine, completely automatically handles. So drivers are just simply charged what they should be charged, depending on the usage or vehicle type. So we're fully linked in with enforce uh, enforcement providers. So we can provide a full digital land management solution so the full car park is managed, closely aligned with the ethos of what the car park should be delivering, which in our view is fully flexible parking without the need for stress, particularly the stress around having to pay and the fear of getting a parking charge notice. On the next slide, I'll go into just a touch of detail around how this, how this works. So any driver, whether that's a patient or staff or, or visitor, uh, needs to only sign up once. 
in all of our car parks, there are a lot of these cheerful blue signage and drivers take less than a minute to sign up to our system. Once they're registered, they're able to come and go in any Hazar AutoPay enabled car park. They'll simply get an email to say, you're entering a new car park, a new Hazar enabled car park for the first time. Please don't do anything to pay. We've got you covered. You're covered by our no parking charge notice guarantee, which is very important. So it's an ironclad guarantee. Don't do anything. It's absolutely uh, sorted for you. I mean, this is particularly important when you look at the types of folks that may be visiting a hospital more often. Uh, for example, we are uh, being given strong support by the uh, Disabled Motoring UK group because um, this is a much better system for disabled drivers because there's no app and because there's no need to do anything manual each time the uh, driver is uh, needs to pay for parking. We avoid all of the issues typically associated with a driver having to use, for example, a pay station or a fiddly app, which they might not have the uh, hand dexterity to be able to code with. We also have a lot of anecdotal evidence as to how the system is used. For example, we quite often have a uh, the middle generation putting all the cars for their family on their own account. So in this way, when elderly relatives perhaps are uh, driving into car parks, they've already had the system set up for them, so they don't have to do anything. So there's no issues around elderly uh, relatives, for example, becoming confused in the car park, forgetting to pay, which again is, is a very common, and it is a very common issue, um, particularly in, in a stressful situation like a hospital environment, um, and then receiving a parking charge notice. So in this example here, um, we also have staff given a digital hazard permit uh, to allow them again to pay a reduced, reduced rate. And I'll move on to the next slide. So just a bit of um, uh, a, a follow-up study we've uh, conducted in another one of our car parks, uh, just to show the speed of adoption. Um, in a car park that had around uh, 12,000 um, unique visitors in a month, 1,000 of them signed up to the autopay system within the first month, with just 200 choosing to use um, a legacy uh, app-based system. So um, after only two weeks, 65% of payments from uh, the NHS staff specifically were already using the Hazard autopay system. Uh, and, and again, after that, same uh, two-week period, 40% of all payments were made through the Hazar system. So you can see the transition very quickly from zero to two weeks and then two weeks to one month uh, was rapid. And we'll move on to the next slide now. I'll, I'll conclude because I see we're running short of time, so I'll, I'll sort of race through. The, the final point I suppose I would, I would make is that the system is very easy to set up. We appreciate that no one afford downtime in a hospital car park. Frankly, it's too important. We generally have our system set up within three to four weeks of a go live date, which is pretty rapid. And they're very lightweight systems because there are no barriers and because there is, there's no extensive uh, infrastructure to install along the lines of uh, pay systems. We're able to put our systems in, in a very lightweight format. We simply need cameras and then our extensive technological back end uh, is all uh, assigned behind the scenes. We have a full team that will be dedicated to a hospital um, car park estate that will help onboard staff, ensure they've all got the correct permits, provide customer support. I think that customer support is a real key element to what we do as well because we don't want drivers then having to contact facilities to say, how do I sign up for parking? I've got a problem with my permit. I'm sure the folks listening in on this call have got uh, uh, fond memories of being contacted by irate doctors, et cetera, uh, questioning why they're paying a certain fee uh, for parking. We want to handle all of that. So we want to reduce the admin burden as well. I can see Sharon popping up. So I think I'm getting a nudge to, uh, to conclude. So thank you all for your time. If anyone's got any questions, my email's on screen. Uh, we're happy to advise so if anyone's got any stressful parking situations they want to talk to us about, uh, please feel free to drop me an email and I'll be happy to help. 
Oh, thank you, David. That was really, really thank good. You. Um, very interesting. Uh, there was some questions that come in, and we'll 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 do them at the end. So, um, we now want to move on to our um, last but certainly not least final panelist, Rachel Baxter, who's the operations director at Total Parking Solution. Uh, Rachel's been in uh, in the industry um, for about eight years now. Um, she got into it, I think, a little bit like default, by, like myself, <laughs> fall into it, and then you, you kind of stick around. Um, I met Rachel probably about six years ago, and we keep meet, bumping into each other at um, various events. And Total Parking Solutions is actually one of um, Zap Park's operators. They use the Zap Park software. So over to you, Rachel. Um, interested to hear your take on it. All right, thanks, Sharon. Yeah, I've worked um, for Total Parking for about three and a half years and in the industry for about eight years. Sharon's usually bumped into at many industry events. Uh, so a lot of my experience really is around NHS trusts and higher education facilities. So we can move to the first slide. So Total Parking has been involved in NHS parking management for around 15 years. And obviously in this time, there's been many changes in behaviours and demands on parking. Uh, this has obviously changed how uh, we manage car parks. Uh, our philosophy has always been to give the motorist every opportunity to comply with parking conditions. And a bit like some of the other panellists have suggested, you know, putting in lots of payment uh, options and solutions to, to allow uh, compliance. Uh, it's stood as in good stead um, in lots of NHS environments that we work with. Next slide, please. So working to resolve some of the problems our clients face, um, we have invested in a, an in-house developed innovative modular parking platform, I needed to get the right teeth in for that, uh, which we call Total Park. Uh, predominantly, it has been designed around NHS environments. This allows us to create a bespoke solution dependent on the needs and complex complexity of the site, in turn to create an ideal visitor experience. So Total Park being modular allows each park to work independently of, a, of each other, uh, from event parking to lifting barriers. Or in the case which is generally important to hospitals, staff permit management. Um, I see in the questions, uh, somebody mentioned the pay-as-you-go system. Um, whilst we have deployed this, we, whilst we haven't deployed this for an NHS trust, we do have this operating in many edu uh, higher educational facilities quite well. So our permit management system will help reduce uh, administration overhead. It uses the needs-based criteria, journey planners, waiting systems, approval processes, gives motorists opportunity to manage their account online so no more coming in saying i've got a higher car i need a temporary pass etc uh, i could go on but that leads me to some of the common relatable problems next slide please so i was asked just to pick a couple of problems that we've seen in trusts recently and there are obviously many so i just picked up uh two um you know, generally, nobody wants to pay for parking in a hospital. Uh, I certainly don't. Um, staff generally don't and find it really unfair. And visitors generally perceive high tariffs. Um, what people forget is car parks are not free and they need to be lined, lit, cleaned, maintained, etc. All these things obviously are a cost. So two, yeah, two items I've picked are staff parking in patient visitor areas and blue badge authorization and validation. So staff parking, um, we see a lot of staff parking, pay, parking in uh, visitor and patient parking, <laughs> thanks Mark, <laughs> car parks. Although generally we find they do pay, they do this out of desperation to get to work, etc. Um, so if they're paying, is that an issue? Well, the issue really arises because it reduces, obviously, available parking for visitor and patients. Generally, staff, the majority of parking in hospitals is reserved for staff. Uh, this then could obviously lead to um, patients being forced to break the rules potentially themselves and could come up against enforcement. So to keep the staff out of some of the car parks where possible is quite important. But how do you identify staff? This is really difficult because some staff won't be on the system and they are pretty much impossible for us to, to identify. 
without following them around. Uh, not that I'm suggesting we should do that. But what we uh, are doing at the moment is linking our payment management system um, to a machine that we're working with, payment machine provider. And this will then prompt staff when they put their registration into a machine that they are a permit holder and really shouldn't be parking in here. Obviously, uh, it is possible that a staff member could find themselves needing to visit the hospital. Um, so obviously then that becomes okay. Uh, this data will then be available to the trust to review should they wish. The car parts can be checked by a parking attendant also to see if there are known staff in the car park. Can I have the next slide, please? So another issue is blue badge concession administration. I think uh, previous uh, panelists have discussed various different ways in managing those. Um, I think in hospitals, a lot of people do still use machines. Um, we've still got a demographic of, of uh, people that aren't so used to apps in my experience. So this can cause quite a burden on trust and also for the visitor, sometimes, you know, the, the car park office or the validation area could be a little bit of a, a trek for, for some people. So um, we've been working with a manufacturer to um, use scanners to validate the badge, which can allow concessionary parking. And this reducing the administration for hospital and inconvenience to the visitor. However, this won't remove uh, uh, abuse we know this, that there's always abuse with these, and until they're digital, I think there always will be. Um, but our analysis has shown that this, that generally these, you know, is being used as intended. Can I have the next slide, please? So one thing we've learned in the years of working with hospitals um, is that they all want to do something a little different, and one size definitely doesn't fit all. Um, each trust has a car parking policy, which we apply alongside the BPA code of practice, ensuring compliance. Hospitals are ever-changing environments, therefore we need to be able to communicate trust requirements to the internal field staff. Uh, I think uh, Sharon touched upon this earlier. Um, recently, there was a rail strike. We needed to tell the staff not to enforce. So it's really important that we can communicate with the field staff. So intelligent systems and staff education are really required to apply these policies when managing the car park. Uh, TPS ethos is we don't believe that contracts should be managed solely for PCM revenue. Tickets should be a last resort and there should be a robust appeals charge to deal with mitigating circumstances. Next slide. And that's me done. So thank you very much for your time. Very much Rachel that was great thanks every much every much so what we're going to do now everyone if everyone just wants to pop the cameras back on we'll go through some of the questions that have been um... I want my camera back on oh so... I'm talking <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you but we can't see you lovely oh there I couldn't put it back on I'm here <laughs> there you are I'm all so thanks everyone that was really great um We've, we've had quite a lot of questions that have been coming in. I know we had even questions before um, the event started. So I know some of you kindly answered some of those questions for me when I was doing my bit. So thanks for that. So if we just go through all the questions starting at the top, we'll start with the open ones. So, um, oh, Mark, I knew you'd be in there. I knew you'd be in there. Um, so your question, Mark Moran has asked a question to um, yourself, Dave. Um, so he's just said, with the current NHS guidelines to have a pay on exit, um, pay for stay approach to patients, should uh, it not be asked to predict how long they will be parking for? I think you're on mute. I completely agree with that. They absolutely should be a pay on exit. And that effectively is how our system works. It's a more advanced form of pay on exit because the driver doesn't have to actually manually pay on exit. They are simply charged automatically the length of stay. Uh, I've noticed that although the advice uh, is that all hospitals now should be pay on exit, there are still many that aren't. Uh, when I've gone round various uh, hostels, there are still them. Uh, there's, there are still car parks that have got pay on entry, you know, old school pay and display machines. Uh, so first port of call is to replace those. 
Um, and, but of course, many of the hospitals can't replace those with a pay on exit system if they haven't got the budget to pay for expensive pay on exit hardware, which again is why our solution works well here because there is no hardware, there is no cost to implementing our solution like ours in terms of hardware. So we are in effect an automatic pay on exit system without any cost. So I, I, I completely agree with the, uh, okay. with the tone of the question. One of the other questions Mark asked himself, um, Dave, was um, how do you ensure compliance? So are PCNs issued to visitors? Um, so when we take over, sorry. Uh, so yeah, when we take over the management of a site, uh, we will work with an enforcement partner. So yes, parking charge notices are issued uh, for those people who refuse to comply. However, uh, when we look through our sites and we have evidence of numbers of PCN or parking charge notices issued before and after uh, our presence or after our presence of a, being there for a few months, we, uh, we issue in our car parks or our partners issue in our car parks roughly half the rate uh, that they were before. So effectively, when you bring Hazar in, not only are you getting an easier experience for your users, you're roughly halving the number of uh, compliance issues and therefore halving the number of parking charge notices. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, the, obviously, Colin McEwen, um, I'm taking it you're one of our Scottish uh, colleagues. Uh, you wanted me to refer more to um, the situation in Scotland. I've, I haven't got a, like a vast amount of, I'm not working with any trust in Scotland. And um, it would be quite interesting actually if we have got anybody on just to put, um, something in the, the q and x section just on what your experiences are um with not charging staff for parking how you you know maintain the car parks and so we'd be really interested to hear from anyone um if anyone's got that but i will reach out to you colin after this um apologize and i will give you the latest um up-to-date legislation in, in regards to scotland um hello gareth yeah i think you're just saying hello there from west hearts hospitals is on um, and we've got a question for you, Sk uh, Scott, from Nick. Um, Nick Patchett, he says, uh, your points on ease of use and simplification are key. Uh, do you offer what I might call a sandpit to inform, help hospital management and properly set their policies? Um, do you want it's, to answer that, Scott? Since it's something, yes, we do um, offer. I mean, historically, especially in the last 12 months, this is kind of, found myself almost in a consultative approach in terms of going to the trust's um, sites and reviewing their current um, policies and looking at how they enforce or how they actually use the sites. Because again, historically, they tend to be car parks that are born out of spaces where they all of a sudden need a requirement and a plot of land comes up, it's turned into a car park <clears throat> and it tends not to join up very well. And again, a lot of them had, tend to have mixed uses. Um, so staff and visitors in the same car park, how can we effectively use technology? So yes, it's something we can do, but it's done at bespoke level, trust by trust, because I think as Rachel mentioned, it's very bespoke and everyone has their own way of doing things. Absolutely. Um, we have another question for you, Barry, uh, from Fiona Pet. She said, um, did you develop a travel plan for the Northern Care Alliance as a whole or as an individual site? Um, I don't know if she means by you, you're actually four yeah. separate hospitals, aren't you? We're four, yeah, we're, we're actually four separate care organisations. So what we did, Fiona, is, is that we've been a little bit patchy historically with travel plans, is, is our hands in the air. Most of the time, they were only done to suit a particular development and the planning conditions that we were looking for. So we've sort of, where I've mentioned TDM, we've sort of started an approach in that we've we fired out some of our initiatives and done those group wide and sought the funding to introduce those group wide. And we're now going through a process of renewing our travel plans for each care organisation and ensuring that they've got the group aspects, but also ideally they create a local focus. But again, you, you, the operational issues with the NHS and, and and the strains and stresses and various things which, which Peter's been done today is we're sort of creating a template travel plan. So I've got a consultancy supporting us to do that travel plan work to develop the initial bones of that and then roll that out. I would say for us, we could get the sequencing in line, but ideally I'd have loved to have had a, an NCA strategy and then the travel plans and got the sequencing just right. But I think sometimes you just need to take a scattergun through it and go 
and then start to pull it together afterwards. Thank you, Barry. Um, we've got a question for you, Rachel, from um, Mark Moran. I think that's somewhere in the chat. Yeah, so um, Total Parking, is your, your, you've got your own platform built. Does this reflect the failure by the market to provide you with what you want to bear in mind? There are so many permits and payment systems available mm. there. I don't think it's a failure. I think, you know, we've just probably taken what quite a few people are doing and put it together in a modular um, environment. It's given us the opportunity to control costs, obviously, because obviously cost is always very important. Um, it gives us opportunity to, you know, develop and improve. We've worked with clients for a long time and we've learned that, as again, as I said earlier, one, you know, they all want something different so this gives us control to develop and change what's needed as we we go along yeah and i think just to go back mark to to, to, to what i was trying the point that i was trying to make when i was covering mine is um what what i think healthcare trusts need to consider when they they look at um, a permit system is to get one that is um you know flexible really that um not, not so much that they, they want to be building like a bespoke one to them, but to get a flexible software company that, um, you know, they can make those changes easily um, to the system because obviously we appreciate everyone's got like different requirements. Um, one of the other questions that's come through, another one for you, uh, Dave, is from Doug Mather. Hello, Doug. Uh, nice of you to join us. We finally actually met Doug, uh, I think face-to-face -face at ParkX. Um, so he's asked, is sending an email enough of a message when drivers arrive in a car park that they are not aware already that there's a Jose car park? And um, if they've already... Absolutely. Been, yeah, so I'm like, you can go. So, um, absolutely. So we've actually got solutions uh, that, that use mobiles as well, and it's really a... Uh, as in text messaging, uh, and it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there's, a, there's a fine line to be struck between making sure everyone knows when a hazard enabled car park uh, and making sure we don't overly communicate that fact to people. So we have, um, and, and I see you've, you've used the Hazar system uh, in Coventry Council, who's one of our Coventry Council, being one of our clients uh, across Coventry. So thank you very much for that. Um, we have um, an awful lot of signage in, in, in our car parks, but we are always looking for more ways to communicate. Uh, it's often the landowner uh, will, will often limit the amount of signage uh, we can have to, to sort of fit with various regulatory bodies, but particularly in things like hospitals, uh, we err on the side of more signage, the better. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with that. It's all about, in any private land, isn't it? It's about getting that signage right, really. Um, it's really key. Um, Mark Healing's got another question for you, um, Dave. It says, can you tell me if the system of paying for parking according to vehicle type is implemented in any trust? And if so, is this set up for the patient car parks or staff area? It is, uh, so short answer is no. Um, we've got that set up in council car parks though. Uh, for example, um, Croydon Council uh, is one of our clients. We've got that set, a missions-based charging set up um, there, whereby um, I believe electric vehicles are paying 20p an hour and it's um, gradiated, but the, the uh, most hungry diesel vehicles are paying something like, I think it's something like £2.50 an hour, so a very strong range. We haven't had any trusts that yet think it's a good idea to implement that. I am i can't say I'm an expert on, on policy, uh, but I can tell you what the effects of implementing that has been in the council. Um, and I'll, I'll actually, I'll use two councils as an example of this. Uh, Oxford Council, again, is another one of ours, uh, and they're we provide a lot of data around how the implementation of EV chargers has led to an increase in EV vehicle usage. And in both Coventry, uh, sorry, in both Oxford and Croydon councils, since implementing these uh, policies, there's been a significant increase in EV usage. However, what I would say is that it is a very brave policy to implement. And it was, and in, in, in all cases, it is not without a significant level of uh, hostility to, towards the policy. It is a very diverse, uh, uh, divisive strategy to pursue. Uh, mm -hmm. 
almost to the extent that it's it's the equivalent of the amount of noise that an increase in parking charge notices creates. Uh, so it is definitely a proceed with caution on that, but, but the effects do seem to be an increase in EV vehicles. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, this one I'm going to give to you, Barry, if you don't mind. Um, Mark has another question. Um, so obviously we focused um, very much on hospitals um, in, in, our, in our presentation today. And as I said, can uh, medical facilities such as GP surgeries and clinics, um, you know, learn from basically the lessons like that you've learned? Would you give any advice to anyone who is potentially looking um, you know, GP's office maybe potentially looking for enforcement or to put a permit to come in and staff? I think th there's lessons for each of those locations to learn from us. We're, we're currently, we, we've, we've inherited or we're taking on more community settings. So we've got quite a number of these GP surgeries and locations. The added channel, the added, the added issues that we have for trying to bring it into our parking policy and operations, are often we're not actually the, the landowner um, and, and it's a facility that we're renting. So we're beholden to whatever conditions are in that facility at the time um, uh, and also there is a historic basis in the way that their parking has operated so what we're trying to do with the systems and the policy and procedure that we've got is retain that flexibility but then ensure that they can learn from us we often find that a number of the gp surgeries they, they tend to have the same sort of issue just in miniature for us so it's being able to allow our own enforcement aspects and our application aspects and what we do, but also our TDM measures to be able to apply those to other locations out within the community. Um, so at the moment, that's still a learning process from us because we're just starting to become aware of these locations and what we can do, but it's having that little bit of flexibility in place to cope with that. But I think it's, this, it's the same issue. It's just on a micro scale. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Barry. Um, Stuart Cole has got another question for you, David. Um, what if people forget to update a new registration number? How do you prompt them to make sure that the information is up to date? Uh, without this, surely they'd be getting a PCN issued. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so thank you for that. So firstly, on sign up, we have uh, our systems connected um, essentially to the DVLA. Um, uh, via a um, pretty cool piece of tech. Uh, so when the user first enters their registration, we have a check message to say, is this your car? So if you enter your registry, say, is this a, you know, um, Skoda Fabia, black Skoda Fabia? Uh, so we ensure we get the registration right in the first instance, which is the first hurdle. Um, a lot of PCNs are being issued still because users don't know their registration or they get it wrong. Even if they are cancelled at a later date, they still have the stress of being issued a PCN. So we get that bit right first. In terms of if they get a new car, one of the advantages is if you bring in a company like ours as opposed to an enforcement company, fundamentally run the car park. As I say, we're geared towards not giving parking charge notices. So of course, if someone has a completely new vehicle and they don't tell us, they will get a parking charge notice because they still have to update the system. But the advantage of having our system there, unlike, for example, a display machine, is we have communication and contact with the driver. So it's very simple for us when the driver then appeals, we can look in our system and say, yep, this is a driver that's with us. They were regularly parking with us, have that PCN cancelled, and we can help the driver to update the vehicle on account. Thanks, Dave. I hope that answers your question, Stuart. I don't know if anyone's getting any feedback, but I can sometimes hear my voice back, so apologies if you're getting any feedback there. Um, one of um, another question from Mark to all the panel really is how can the parking needs of healthcare professionals working in the community be better served? I, I can answer that from like a software uh, point of view. Um, obviously, with um, that permit system, uh, we you know you can do like a multitude of different permit types. So if they are coming you know, in and out of um, the hospital facilities or even the GP practice and stuff like that. They can apply for different permit types um, to suit, you know, the working hours. So, you know, whatever days a week, you know, so they're not paying for the whole um, season, they're just paying for their usage. So, so we can do things like that. Is anybody else on the panel got any suggestions on that one? 
Um, well, Sharon, I've worked with a trust that has had a short stay car park. Um, you know, if you if you're only just literally popping into the hospital for a short time to sort of load and load, yeah. um, a couple of hours just to prevent staff parking in there all day has worked quite well. Yeah, and we do we do things like um, the virtual visitor vouchers or virtual scratch cards, where um, you know staff members can purchase books of say twenty, and then they'll just use one as and when they park. Uh, it's like but it like works in the same way as the old fashioned scratch cards where you scratch it off, but it's um, virtual. It's on the app, so all things like that can help really. Um, just looking through the questions, I think we've answered them all. If anyone can see any that we haven't answered, um, let's have a look. Is there any more on that? I know we answered some earlier that were um, coming in. Barry answered them kindly for me live. Um, Nix was answered. Um, is there any of them you want to revisit? guys um it'd be great to share so yeah in terms of the slides i know people have said about the slide all the slides that have been shared today um landor will be sharing them with everyone that's registered so you'll be able to get access to the slides and unfortunately for me you'll be able to get access to watch the um the the, the video so if you want to share the the the, the link with any of your colleagues they can watch the webinar uh, because it has been recorded so um there are all the questions i think Mark had another one about um, Scotland. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on the panel. I know what my thoughts on this. So uh, the situation um, is, is Wales obviously offer all parking to staff um, free and they have done since about 2018 and the majority of Scotland did as well. Um, and I think they had the remaining three trusts that were still charging for, for parking that was kind of brought to um, and then during the COVID period, we just stopped it all, all across the board. Um, I don't know, what is, what is other people's thoughts? And Barry, it'd be interesting to use this. If, if a trust went down the route that they, they, they wanted to offer um, free parking across the board for the staff, um, what would you be your suggestions on that? Or have you got any ideas that you want to share? At, at the moment, we're on a, we're on that sort of trajectory out we haven't reintroduced our parking charges yet we've got our task and finish group that is currently looking at that some of the some of the comments within that group are we should look to try and keep staff parking free but what we're trying to do is quantify just what the implications of that would be so that everybody on the group is be aware because as rachel mentioned in her presentation maintaining car parks and operating car parks is not free that there's a cost to that and, and at the moment the way that the nhs has set up we, we we can't use that cost we can't get that cost from elsewhere because it's impacting upon the health care budget and that that's the difficulty of it we, we're currently looking at that and we're currently looking at we're operating all our systems currently without charging our staff to park but charging our patients and visitors and we know that at the moment that isn't working, but I'm aware that some colleagues, it, it's a larger decision whether to charge for parking, which is one of the questions that you put up in your presentation. So it, 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 it's removed beyond a lot of us that are operating in, in estates and facilities and actually managing the travel and the parking aspects. That decision's become political and it's moved beyond us. But what we have to make sure is that we can clearly and concisely give our input into that and whatever it comes up with, our systems and, and whichever providers that we've got have got the flexibility to work with that. Um, and, and that's all we can try and do with that. I mean, I just noticed on the bottom end of the Q&A, Manny's just put on as an experienced parking consultant. Yes, I agree with that. They, they are some of the most broken and poorly run parking facilities. A lot of the time it's because it, it, it's an afterthought for NHS colleagues. They get tagged with parking. I, I actually got it. I've had it about 13 years, but I ended up with it by accident. And it's just trying to apply that thing. And some of the presentation that I was trying to put in, Manny, is it's not just about parking. It's the entire concept of travel and how we run our organisations and how we, we manage a lot of the stuff that we have in NHS. It, it, it's crisis travel. It's crisis demand in that it's only at a point of crisis where people need the facilities that we have and it's quite difficult to plan for that and know what that is but it's again what i mentioned in my presentation is whatever we do and for all of us on this call and discussion it's an honest and open partnership in what we can do 
and what we can deliver and how we can make it better. Very well said, Barry. And I think uh, Peter, who was originally um, going to be on the webinar, he, he, uh, they, they do a lot of consultation with their staff and obviously it's ongoing really just to see, uh, you know, they very much get staff input into it before making any decisions. So um, I can see that um, I'm getting pinged that we kind of uh, coming to an end. So um, I, I, I found that really useful. For, for me, it was really interesting to hear, um, you know, what the fellow industry people, you know, they're taking their approach on it and stuff. And, and, and in particular, Barry, thank you ever so much for stepping in um, at the final hour. Um, I think, you know, your input into the session has been invaluable, really. Um, thanks very much, um, Dave. Um, thanks to Rachel and Scott for, for their presentations. We will, um, I say, we'll upload this presentation um, onto the um, Landor Links website now that'll be shared with you. I would like to wish you all a good day and thank you very much for joining us. Take care. Thank you everyone. Bye. There is a plug there for the um, Landor event uh, in Manchester Conference Centre so I'll see you all there. All right thank you bye bye.